small town newspaper. It was New Year's Eve, 2011. Cassius had planned to go to a house party, never missing New Year's festivities. Twyla would be home with now just over two years old, Graciela. It was decided that Twyla could enjoy a bath and a little break while Graciela would accompany her father to the dinner portion of the evening. They supped well. Mama Twyla came at exactly 8.30 p.m. to pick up her daughter. Little Graciela was already tired. There would be folk songs, rocking in the rocking chair, and then they would curl like mermaid's tendrils into a quiet calm. For a fleeting moment, looking at Cassius's ruddy cheeks, his boyish dearness, picking up their child, his frayed Mac jacket, his crooked grin, just for the one moment, Twyla wondered if they could try again. It had been six months. For six months he had barked at her, the bark of a skinny street dog who was surviving somehow against his will, rasping, agonized, harsh in its silver flashes, dripping with fresh saliva. She had cowered to his canine symphony of human mind ache. Each had swollen hearts from the outpouring of demanding, post-fetal feelings. As Twyla peeled away, leaving Daddy to hop on the fast bus to oblivion, she was sure peace in their home was more important than the role Cassius had cast himself in. She had wrangled with it, certainly like a cowhand on a raging bull. She had cried so hard a small vein under her left eye bulged permanently now changed for this lifetime. Her pretty picture face, sporting a Piero doll tear in the form of a blue-gray vein under the eye, above the heart. The human hurt had metamorphosed her along with the childbirth. Ultimately, some things cannot be forgiven. Twyla and Graciela trundled over to the house, exactly seven driveways down, in a tiny bereft little seaside peninsula on an island on the very farthest west coast point of Canada. As they had so many nights, almost every night since the separation, Twyla and Graciela bundled up the side stairs, miniature, lithe Graciela in her mama's arms. Sure enough, Graciela was sound asleep in moments. Twyla got up, went into the kitchen, and made herself popcorn with coconut oil and angevita yeast. It was her standby for nights of disappointment. These nights were less and less as the calm after the storm did its work. She poured a San Pellegrino with lime and ice. Gone were the college days of cigarettes, scotch, and B.C. weed. Graciela had almost cost her mother her life. And yet this tiny bird had also given her mother the best. The truth had come down. In some respects, Twyla's life and the bare-bones realness of it began after she gave life to Graciela. In the giving of the new life, the mother realized her own life. She put this as spinal tap in the DVD player and tried to giggle New Year's Eve away. Still, nothing much was funny through the obscured vision of a broken person not yet through the dark night. It was in the paper the following week. A description of a shotgun and the type used to put 13 bullet holes in the side of the trailer. The woman brandishing the shotgun. The attempt on a life, or that's what it is called when a gun is held and used in self-defense, a near homicide. Cassius had taken a case of beer to the soiree. He had simultaneously added cocaine, weed, ecstasy, and a severely broken heart. Not even just broken, mangled. Garbled and distorted was his heart. And evidently his head when he also began to find Luella highly attractive that night. Had it been her pain, she was so vulnerable. Luella was on Coast Guard and had rescued her Aunt Maud from a serious tidal swing up Lehman's Inlet. She pulled her auntie out of the water. Already the deadness had set in. Already Maud was turning blue. Luella had held her auntie close, hoping even for a dying breath. Maud was gone about ten minutes before she was even heaved out onto the rescue craft. Luella held death in her arms, entwined, the same arms that had held her since birth. Men often fell for victims, Luella had noted somewhere around her coming out at age 13. She had seen that one many times over. The flailing woman swooped up by the handsome raven.
the Lothario there to aid her in her time of need, there to take the lead. She was fucking done. Give the gal another rum and coke, and let's get to the cocaine, please. Now. It was kismet. Cassius had been asked to leave his home with his wife and child exactly 179 days earlier. In the middle of the day, another day of no work with a hangover. Imagine the bitch asking him, the awesome, to leave. Had he not put his fucking time in? He had told her he loved her every time he came back. Fucking stayed home with his head aching, missing out on the guys to be with her. Quick shower, change the shirt, and off to another bonfire, friend's birthday party. Late surf, night out at the Mac. Fucking had it. As he nailed his surfboard into the 98 Volvo, smashing the front glass and then smashing it again for good measure. A spidery vein across the windshield. You won't be driving that until the glass is fixed, the car guy had said. The car Twyla would drive their child in. The car they had quibbled on for safety. In a perfect stew of missed connection, broken-heartedness, failed sanctity, booze and white powder, they found each other. Cassius, done with any moral compass he'd been offered, done with homelessness, done with the bitch who wrecked the sandbox. Luella, done with the sight in her mind of her dead auntie, done with calm, done with going on for the sake of life that still thrives, looking for drama. Looking for some spice, was Luella, the first touch of Cassius's arm on her shoulder. She'd moved his hand to her thigh quickly. Fuck him. Fuck any one of consequence, and fuck consequences. Cassius hadn't been laid in months. Longer, really, because Twyla wasn't giving it to him since before the baby. Luella was stuck in second thoughts of marriage. Coming out in a town of 1600 had been excruciating. Now, she would marry. Luella, never one for certainty of any kind, a booze-soaked Libra, was having some serious second thoughts about marrying Brianna. Diffidence had always been her weak socket. She formed a vague, reptilian strategy in her Machiavellian mind to oust the insecurity by getting some kind of proof. Put the baby to bed once and for all. Naily lid, cedar coffin. Bang it. The perfect mixture of the broken spirit born of insecurity and distress united the two imps. The flirting took on a gargantuan and now unconcealed dimension. It was 2 a.m. The party was slowing to a dull roar. Cassius took Luella's arm and said he'd walk her home. He was her friend for years now. Back to the trailer that was the home of two gay fiancés, Brianna and Luella. Two women who'd overcome homophobic slurs and the cold chill from families of ignoramuses on each side. This home would, in one month exactly, be the dressing room for these two women as they put on their finest to wed one another. This home housed the hurt they had each undergone in coming out to tell the people who they thought had loved them the truth. This tiny home, this tin shack, had been Lou and Bree's love nest for four years was all they could afford, paid off in time for the next big purchase, their union. A shotgun lay under the bed. A bike, a breeze, lay against the front wall in the hallway. A smattering of pictures they had taken as women who love one another in times their love had been blazing sat on the faux mantelpiece. Steph's wedding, the birth of cousin Nora, skiing in Sun Valley. The deer carcass they'd hunted, which had sustained them for months over a full year. Each woman in hunting gear, massive grins. Drinks at Bessie's. A day they felt girly and put on frocks and had a picnic. A picture of Lou's Aunt Maud in good health on the fridge. A hazy collage of pictures decorated Cassius's mind that early morn. A dick swollen and purple and entering a bleached, manicured anus in the last porn he'd watched as he smoked a joint the night before. A wave he'd taken, only to have the fin of the board slash his hand. Another week off work. The searing pain of the shoulder he's dislocated biking home wasted. His tiny new daughter gazing at him, two days old, jaundiced and fascinated by her father. His ex-wife's legs. 
Twyla, sinewy and graceful as she ran in to get the basmati brown rice off the stove. The dancing women in the cast of Mamma Mia, blowy and giggling, his favorite film. His father's hand holding his as he had died four and a half years before. A death culminating a long, arduous struggle with muscular dystrophy. A beer emptied next to his father when he had been a child. The pictures mixed together like a cauldron of wicked intent in a coven. Each soul with its own grief, its own emaciating agony, its own litany of abuse. The souls of the forgotten people. The deliberately forgetting people. The people, once parents quite by accident, who had asked their children to leave immediately after the onset of puberty. These two misguided souls had not had the benefit of questioning nor the benefit of guidance. These souls related to oblivion. Cassius and Luella were about to make a hell of a mistake. They sauntered drunkenly into the trailer, smashing the aloe hanging in a pot shaped like half a sphere. Boots kicked off, jeans to follow. Bree had stayed at the tail end of the party. Cassius led by his cock. Luella led by the desire to be certain her woman was indeed hers. The level of personal timidity only a real cheater knows intimately. Triangulation. Defined by shrinks as the need to manipulate two others into being under one, fighting for the one, while the one pedestalizes himself. The weapon of choice for any narcissist. And so they fucked. Not passionate, sensuous, hold-you-all-night sex. Not drippy with steamy realization of the heart's yearning. They fucked like banshees on a mission. They became virtual bonobos. They fucked like it would take them somewhere other than the shit existences they each attempted to validate with stupid subtext and random drunk conversations at other random drunk people's places. She could take it like a man. He gave it to her in the ass. Bum up, he laid it in, like a barrel of a gun. Just at the point Cassius was about to climax, he went to a nebulous, purplish place in his mind. Bree found her bike pretty quickly for a girl that could not stand up. She walked into her home, the home she shared with her fiancé, the home that would be the after-party spot for their wedding. She saw the pictures whizzing past her in a blurry milieu as she stumbled in, calling for her lover. Luella! Luella! The smattering of pictures they had taken as women who love one another in times their love had been blazing on the faux mantelpiece of the trailer. Steph's wedding. The birth of Cousin Nora. Skiing in Sun Valley. The deer carcass they'd hunted, which had sustained them for months over last year. Each woman in hunting gear, massive grins. Drinks at Bessie's. A day they felt girly and put on frocks and had a picnic. A picture of Lou's Aunt Maud still in good health on the fridge. Bree walked in, calling out, I love you. I'm here to love you, Lou. Let's dance. She got to the bathroom, took off her clothes to her underwear. She would need water. Bree lurched toward the kitchen to get water. The bedroom door was half open. She kept going. But wait. Bree had seen something out of the corner of her eye. She saw an ass. Bree heard a man and saw a man with a hairy bare ass fucking the living shit out of her woman. And Bree grabbed her bike, now clear as a bell with adrenaline. She took her ten speed and nailed Cassius's bare ass, knocked him clear out of the bed. Luella and Cassius became night creatures, void of form. Cassius had taken a hit to the head hard and was rolling on the floor, the obliterated world around him reeling. He hadn't even come. His come had been interrupted by a woman who spent her days whistling while she worked and hacking butts, a flagger on the highway. Each woman went ape. Blind rage came over Bree while she threw everything in their home that had ever meant anything to her at Luella. Turrets, cusses, escaping at each fling of now junk. She could not stop. She seethed and freaked and threw and spat and swore and thundered a bit more and just for good measure. 
Bree threatened to kill Cassius and Luella. At that point, Luella slowly reached down, eyes wide with cocaine. She spotted the gun, grabbed it, pulled the trigger back, and cocked it at Bree. You can't kill either of us. They'll ding you for manslaughter. You'll be fucked, she said to her cuckold, not a waver in her voice. She fired a warning shot at the side of the trailer. It felt good, so she fired a few more. The neighbors came. Three people, a third of them half-clothed in a staggering, fragmented mess, cuts and blood. Thirteen bullet holes in the side of the trailer. The press got the story next day from the police report. Seeing as only Luella's full name was mentioned as the woman who fought back in self-defense, Twyla paid the article no heed when she glanced it in the paper two days later, while in line at the grocery store waiting to pay for roast beef, salad greens, baby potatoes, and goldfish crackers with Graciela, just over two years old. In all fairness, Twyla had always been fascinated by monsters. At some point in life, there are no more surprises. Everything is entirely predictable. Consequences happen. There is no use in reaction. There is no need for it eventually. The sitting and passing of time, apart from the necessary junctures of life, works faster in due course. Observation is usually the best place to go once that time comes.